So can everyone see those slides okay? Um, again, just uh, indicate in the chat or nod. Perfect. Great. So yes, thanks very much for logging in today and joining on a really hot uh, July morning. Um, my name is Mark Atkinson. I'm a researcher and I sit within DEFRA's Marine and Fisheries Social Science team. And for about the last 12 months or so, uh, I've been supporting um, this evidence project um, to, um, to support understanding of, of public ocean literacy at national level. Uh, this project uh, published its headline findings report this June, June the 8th on World Oceans Day. And it's these fi findings uh, and some of the background and development to the survey that I'd like to discuss today. Um, so just a quick overview, I'm just going to, as I say, give um, a quick overview of the background, um, some of the work, work packages that preceded the actual survey itself. Um, I'm going to talk through some of the main headline uh, findings. I'm afraid I won't ha have a chance to go through everything that's in the report, but uh, I should be able to give a, a good flavour uh, of the breadth of information that we have there. Um, and then I'm going to talk uh, briefly about next steps for the programme of research before we move to a Q&A session with myself, Galbert and Emma McKinley, who uh, we worked very closely together in the development of this project. So there's a huge diversity of ways in which people can experience and interact with the ocean. In terms of our direct interactions, uh, people, people can visit the ocean uh, below the water, uh, they can visit above the wa water and next to the water in kind of coastal margin settings. And the ocean can be a key feature of our everyday living environments, including even urban environments. And we can also visit special educational environments such as aquariums um, and have representative interactions through, for example, TV documentaries that really uh, expose us to what's hidden away for many under the, under the water in the ocean. And this learning can be interactive or it can be more formal or academic and much of our learning and understanding of the ocean can come through other ways so for example play or the kinds of stewardship and the ways that we look after the ocean and try to protect it and it's the diversity of these interactions that really influence uh, people's understanding of the ocean and how they act towards it and all of these really feed into the concept of ocean literacy a widely used original uh, sort of definition of ocean literacy was that it was an understanding of the ocean's influence on you and your understanding on the ocean. Um, but it's fair to say, given the uh, diversity of our kind of many interactions that we have with the ocean that I just outlined, that um, a broader concept of ocean literacy has, has emerged that doesn't just involve uh, knowledge, knowledge exchange and perhaps formal education, but also uh, it's around how we communicate about the ocean, grow and foster emotional connections with it and, and maybe change our behaviours um, to, to protect and, and look after the ocean as well. And it's this broader understanding of ocean literacy that really kind of informed the background to this pro project that DEFRA undertook uh, in collaboration with the Ocean Conservation Trust. So just to say a little bit about the role of ocean literacy in DEFRA's work, um, in part, policy should always really be developed in response to, to public stakeholder priorities and views. And it's important for us always to have good information and a good understanding about what those views are. Um, and it's also important once policy has been implemented and programmes have been implemented within government to understand how uh, that's impacted on the public response um, to ensure that it's effective. And, and we regularly do this in, in monitoring and evaluation of key policy and programmes. And finally, there's a question about whether um, ocean literacy can be an intervention and, and a, a policy mechanism in itself by, by levering, uh, leveraging behaviour change through um, increasing public uh, awareness and understanding and value of the marine environment. So these priorities really cut across a number of national and international policy areas. Uh, on the national side, uh, programmes such as the DEFRA's 25-year plan, uh, Net Zero, and the UK Marine Strategy 
in various ways either require really good uh, indicators and information about the social and economic uses and values of the marine environment or have a role potentially for behavior change in achieving them and internationally with this year being marine super year the launch of the un decade uh, the uk's hosting of cop 26 and involvement in other international commitments uh, DEF has really sought to kind of inform and support this work by demonstrating leadership, by piloting a really uh, ambitious program of, of public um, ocean literacy and understanding levels of public um, ocean literacy in, in, the, in the country. Just to illustrate this a little bit more in a couple of key policy areas, here in the 25-year plan, uh, we have reference to the role of understanding marine values and changing, changing our behaviours and leveraging behaviour change to improving natural environments and particularly the marine natural environment. And in the UN decade, that although um, the decade as a whole is seeking a transformative uh, ocean science, there's a recognition that equally important and equally uh, transformative would be changes in people's values towards the ocean and that ocean literacy efforts um, are really absolutely key as part of this. So this project was originally commissioned by the DEFRA Ocean Climate Policy uh, team and I think the, the emphasis in some of the, the early project aims reflect this but as I think it'll become clear as I go through the presentation that to really measure and understand ocean literacy you really have to have a, a really uh, a kind of broad brush information about a range of public values on particular kinds of policies and benefits um, that emerge from the marine environment. So it's not just an ocean climate issue, it, it, is, it is broader than that. Um, so there were three work packages in this project. Um, the first was um, uh, a review piece which sought to uh, understand some of the conceptual links between ocean literacy and climate related behaviour change. Um, and it also identified potential indicators and question sets which, which could be used to, to monitor and measure climate related uh, behaviour change in, for example, a survey. Work package two was to design and develop a survey suitable for um, measuring ocean literacy at, at a national level, um, drawing on recommendations from, from the review, and also to conduct some initial pre testing with the survey. Um, to check that the uh, questions were com comprehensible and suitable for the public. And finally, in work package three, the uh, aim was to implement this pilot survey um, at a national level um, in what, what eventually was two pilot countries for, for, of Wales and, uh, and England with the support of Natural Resources Wales, and to gain uh, baseline data on the levels of ocean literacy uh, and engagement in cl climate related uh, behaviours and other marine related behaviours as well uh, in those populations. So this is the, uh, the report from Work Package 1 that was uh, authored by uh, Emma and Daryl, who's going to be both on our Q&A panel later. They, uh, they produced this really good piece of work which um, reviewed modules and developed a conceptual framework to think about how we go about measuring ocean li literacy. Uh, and also, as I, as I mentioned just before, just to review previous efforts to conduct survey research on ocean, ocean literacy and make recommendations for some of the best questions for measuring it. This um, report also confirmed that no previous research has been undertaken at the national level in the UK that measures ocean literacy in terms of its broadest uh, definition across all of its potential dimensions. And um, in this slide, um, this, these were the, the, the dimensions of ocean literacy that is recommended were, were measured in the report. They develop uh, six dimensions from uh, Brennan et al's original definition. Um, but the, the review by Emma and Darrell recommended the measurement of at least two additional factors. Um, there's a lot of overlap and there's strong relationships between these dimensions, um, but they are also quite distinct. And just to, just to run through them, um, the first dimension was awareness. So this is the, the high level knowledge that there are issues or problems with the ocean environment. Um, a knowledge dimension, which is more topic specific um, 
knowledge about the ocean that could encompass ecological, economic or social knowledge. Um, attitudes, so encompassing positions on, uh, of agreement or concern um, about the oceans and that may, um, that may involve um, views about pressures, uh, benefits from the ocean or potential policy interventions to address these. Um, communication is uh, sources and platforms in which uh, people gain knowledge about the ocean and also communicate about it. So for example, through social media and also through traditional media, news, films and documentaries. Behaviours are individual personal decisions, choices, actions and habits um, with respect to ocean issues. So they might include, for example, recycling plastic to improve outcomes for the marine environment. And activism is, again, it's a, it's a form of behaviour, but it's really concerned about bringing about changes in others, including in policy and others' attitudes and behaviours. And this might include, for example, uh, going on rallies of demonstration or using your vote based on marine issues. And finally, the two additional dimensions that uh, were um, recommended in this report were the measurement of personal and emotional connection to the ocean, so that includes sense of place, of place attachment, and also emotional connection to the ocean, how thinking and experiencing the ocean uh, makes you feel. And finally, um, access experience and, and proximity, so the ability to directly experience the ocean and coastal margin areas, and that may be uh, the just information about whether people are resident in a coastal area, but also how often they're able to visit and how, how um, their means of transport enables them to access the ocean if they are far away. Work package two um, built upon these recommendations from the evidence synthesis. Um, this took place from October to December last year, and uh, I and members of my team, the Marine and Fisheries Social Science Team in DEFRA, uh, collaborated with Emma and Darrell to draw out recommendations in the report and um, draft, draft a survey questionnaire. Had further input from a range of DEFRA policy teams, um, not just the, uh, the climate policy team I mentioned earlier, but also teams involved in um, the UK marine strategy, uh, vulnerable marine species, plastics and pollution, amongst others. Uh, we had input, of course, from the Ocean Conservation Trust, who are long-term collaborators in this project, Natural Resources Wales, uh, the Ocean Literacy Working Group, who advise uh, on the use of ocean literacy in policy, and uh, as well as wider academic stakeholders. The, um, the, there was also a workshop uh, held specific, specifically with the Ocean Literacy Working Group, cognitive testing with both academic peer experts and the public, and there was an academic peer review from a wider network of, of academics in the questionnaire design as well. And finally, Work Package 3, which ran from January to March this year, we finalised 40 questions in addition to some contextual socio-demographic information such as um, geographic region, age, gender, etc. Uh, there was a mix of open and closed questions and many of the open questions were kind of other responses at the end of a list of, of sort of forced choices if, if that question wasn't, um, the forced choice answers didn't encompass something that was relevant for the participant. Um, and the questions were designed to address ocean literacy, those eight ocean literacy dimensions that I, I ran through from the evidence synthesis. In terms of the sample design, uh, we used an on, online omnibus panel survey. So this is a, a, a sort of longitudinal panel that are accessible to a, a field work or market research agency. And they're selected based on key socio demographic characteristics to make them representative of the populations of England and Wales. And those characteristics are known as quotas, and we use them in, um, uh, for age, gender, English or Welsh reason, residents in a, in a coastal community, and also ethnicity. So now I'd just like to go through uh, the, the, some of the key headline findings of the re report and to illustrate them um, across each of the dimensions. I, I'm afraid we don't, I don't have time to go through every single question that was included in the survey, but hopefully it will give you a sense of the breadth and I can highlight the dimensions where there's, there's quite a lot of further information. So beginning with awareness, um, 
fair to say that the key finding here that is that the uh, majority of the sample, both in the case of the global and local marine environment, viewed its health as, as poor or very poor, and with only 12% rating it uh, as good or very good. Um, there was a slightly higher proportion of the sample uh, rated, rated as poor or very poor in the global case. That may reflect um, particular awareness of, of um, marine issues that's, that kind of manifest themselves in, in the global context, particularly um, the impact of plastics, for example. In terms of their self-rated awareness of uh, the challenges of the global marine environment, this was quite split. Um, I think 31% uh, considered their, their awareness to be poor, but 32% rated it as very good. So although that doesn't clearly, that's difficult to interpret in one direction or another, whatever awareness of challenges the, the, that was present in the sample was enough um, really for um, quite a lot of concern to be expressed about the, the state of both the health of both the, the global and local marine environment. In terms of more specific topics, specific knowledge about the ocean, we measured this by asking uh, participants how familiar they were with uh, particular marine related terms. This is only one possible way that you could assess knowledge and it's perhaps a little crude, but it is very effective in a, in a brief uh, survey, broad survey of this kind. Um, and the results here really showed that uh, the, the key areas where there was a lot of knowledge and understanding were perhaps um, quite sort of broad terms uh, relevant to sustainability that have a fairly long history. Um, they were also, I would say, that, that quite clear in these results that some of the terms more relevant to social science, there was much lower levels of, of knowledge and understanding uh, in the case of natural capital, for example, ocean literacy and marine citizenship. And I certainly think in terms of sustainable fishing and sustainable development, uh, aside from the fact that they have perhaps quite a clear face value meaning, um, they are terms that, that, are, that are older and are perhaps, perhaps better embedded with the public than, than some younger terms that we're starting to use in policy, for example, nature-based solutions. We had quite a lot of information on attitudes, so I'm not going to be able to go through all of it, but um, I'm just going to cover some, some really key areas about um, the attitudes dimension. Uh, the key finding really here is that 85% uh, of the sample said that uh, protecting the marine environment was very important or important to them. So really clear um, attitude to, towards um, you know, pro-marine protection here from the public. Um, in terms of responding to, uh, uh, in terms of activities to address marine is issues, responding to threats, we asked the uh, sample to pick their um, top three activities that were given here. And perhaps unsurprisingly, considering some previous research, the, the priority uh, activities for the public were around regulating pollution and plastics. There was much lower levels of support for uh, for example, using overseas development aid, um, DEFRA never really had a lot of public perceptions, information about using overseas development aid in, a, in an environmental context. So this is an interesting finding and I think something we will have to take away and think about. Um, also uh, notable here is that ocean literacy in terms of supporting more people to engage with the ocean itself is perhaps um, lower level in, in public priorities and something that could potentially be uh, a, learning, um, a learning element of this survey that we maybe need to do more work to really communicate the role of ocean literacy in actually addressing marine issues. Also as part of attitudes, we asked the um, public to, uh, to name their top three pressures uh, posing the most threat to marine environment. Somewhat in line with the last slide, uh, these pressures were, um, the, the, the key pressures for the sample were marine litter and plastic pollution, chemical pollution, with also overfishing and, and climate change quite high. Um, I think uh, my interpretation of this slide tends to be that the concern, it seems to be at the level of those kind of key input pressures. So, you know, the, the, the 
the problem of marine plastics in and of itself or pollution in itself, climate change, rather than perhaps some of the more downstream effects of these problems, where, for example, there's um, you know, loss of species or acidification. So it seems to me, looking at these data from a public point of view, that the, the, the priority pressures, the, the pressures that really sit in, uh, in the public's attitudes and awareness really are at the, the kind of the problems themselves rather than their effects. And I think maybe that's something we can learn for our communication as well. Like in a similar way to the previous slide, the public were asked to uh, name their, their top three benefits for the marine environment. And um, I think somewhat, um, I think it was a, a good finding here that the, the top priority was, was very ecocentric um, and centered on uh, diverse habitats for, for marine plants and animals. There were productive uh, benefits that were also high priority and food to eat, um, weather and climate control um, as also a very important regulating benefit. Out of the social and cultural benefits, the most important were um, research and education and places to support mental health and well-being. These tended to sit a little bit low in priority um, to the, to the um, environmental and kind of key productive benefits, um, but certainly um, the marine environment is very much valued amongst other cultural benefits for its place in, in um, educating us and supporting people's health and well-being. Just moving on to the behaviours dimension, some interesting combination of findings here that um, only just over half the sample thought that their lifestyle had either a positive or negative impact on the marine environment. Um, but despite that, 25% uh, said they would already made changes uh, and plan on doing more, whilst 45% said it was quite likely or very likely that they'll make changes. So more, more than half of the sample, a good deal more than half the sample, despite the fact that there's some ambivalence about whether lifestyle changes actually have an impact on the marine environment, show a willingness uh, to make changes or that they've they've already made them and, and are willing to make more so perhaps an interesting finding that that the public are, are willing to consider that even if they they find the the actual impacts of those changes to be somewhat muted so this specific form of uh, behaviors in terms of activism and trying to change uh, the attitudes and behaviors of others um, it'd be fair to say that across the sample, um, there wasn't a huge amount of marine activism. Um, by far, the, the, the biggest um, form of activism that, that was identified by the sample was, was in terms of making lifestyle changes. Um, beyond that, the uh, petitions and membership of environmental organisations was important, as well as uh, using the vote um, to uh, align with, with political parties that, that, that have strong policies on that. Um, direct activism, activism, for example, um, attending rallies, um, participating in citizen science or volunteering time to support it in, for example, a, a beach clean does have um, a lower, um, lower level of support across the sample. Um, so it seems to be perhaps a little bit more indirect ways of, uh, of, of undertaking marine activism where it's there seems to be the most popular. Um, with lifestyle changes, a, a clear, a clear um, top, top uh, form of activism there for the sample. So communication dimension, this is the sources of knowledge that people are, are using to, to learn about the marine environment. There was um, a quite a strong finding here that, uh, for the role for traditional media, television and radio, film, nature and wildlife documentaries and, and news media for learning about the marine environments is still still a really important uh, way way to communicate um, to people about it and also um, a, a form of knowledge. Social media uh, wa was important, but not not to the same extent. Um, and throughout both social and uh, and traditional media, presumably, there was pretty uh, low. Uh, portion of the sample really uh, indicated that celebrities or influencers were important. Um, so tra traditional media, I think, and I, I imagine, as we'll see in the next slide, um, that um, some of our, our key kind of documentaries, 
that a, that a TV um, that that a broadcast through TV are indicating potentially a, a sort of Attenborough effect here in in communicating about um, marine the marine environment. With that in mind, um, this was a question where we asked the sample to indicate their top three emotions when they think about marine environment. And I, I've still looking at these data that there's a real, um, this seems to align quite closely with, I think, some of the content that people might um, actually experience when, they, when they're watching things like Blue Planet, that there's, there's they're concerned uh, over some of the environmental impacts that are shown, but there's also a lot of awe and wonder and curiosity um, which are important feelings for, for people when they when they think about the marine environment. Um, fortunately, I was pleased to see that very few people were bored by, by the marine environment, which, which is always good. And I think was quite a good sense check for the survey in general, because my experience, um, participants do have ways of expressing the fact that they're not happy with the survey, and that might be one way of doing it, but that seemed to affect very, very few respondents and samples. So that was good to see. And moving on to this, the final uh, dimension that was reviewed in this um, piece of work, which was on experience, access and proximity. And this, uh, this, the questions on this dimension really tried to build on some of the information DEFRA already has available through things like the Natural England People and Nature Survey. It used to be uh, MENI, the monitoring of engagement with natural environment, and also the National Survey for Wales has similar modules in its big household survey. And what this survey was trying to do was take a similar approach, but really get a lot more information about the kinds of marine environments that, that people were visiting, because in those previous surveys I mentioned, we, we don't have a lot about that. We really only know that they're, they're going to, to coastal margins. We don't know the kinds of environments they're going to. I should also preface this by saying that last year was obviously a very special case in terms of um, COVID-19 restrictions, where many people would have been traveling much more locally. Um, or not at all during lockdowns. Um, so with that in mind, um, the data certainly suggests that like over the last 12 months, 40% uh, had, had visited the marine environment, but 48% had not in the last 12 months and 11% had never been visited. Um, so fairly low levels of engagement and perhaps not typical of a, of a normal year. And, and I think if we run this survey in the future, uh, we'll be interested to see changes um, as, as the situation with the pandemic does change. Looking at the particular environments that were had very high levels of visits, um, these tended to be in, in areas that could accommodate built up, I would say built up areas and population centres, so coastal and seaside towns and beaches, um, as opposed to at the bottom there, areas that were unlikely to be themselves built up or, or perhaps areas of big population centres, so coastal marsh, obviously open sea and, and mud flats. It would be interesting to do further analysis on this data to take, you know, take into account uh, people's proximity to population centres. So when people are making perhaps um, longer visits, they're travelling further, which of these environments are of interest to them? Um, that's something I think we're keen to look at um, in, in the next steps of this survey. And again, building on some of the information we have in, in our other environmental engagement surveys, we, we try to um, find out a lot more about marine specific recreational activities that people were doing. Um, having said that, it does align quite a lot with our, um, our other evidence base in, in that walking with and without a dog is, is a, a hugely popular activity. Um, but it was interesting that the, the capture of the, the visual quality of the marine environment came out as being very important with uh, photography and, and videography. Uh, and they also quite high up here, 23%, 22% of the sample relative to some of the other activities, um, highlighted the importance of heritage and also seeing coastal wildlife in, in shaping their recreational experiences. So that's... Um, that's all I'm going to say about the findings of the report. Please obviously do, do have a look at the report itself. There's a number of other questions um, and that are described just in the headline findings. Um, I'd just like to finally talk a little bit about some of the next steps for this work. 
um, and what we hope to produce and publish over the coming months and uh, towards the end of uh, end of the year. The um, we have we have additional questions. Um, we have a lot of concept textual information, social demographic information that can be used um to understand how the, some of the responses i've outlined change by uh people's location um, by their age by other kinds of social economic factors such as um we have the index of uh, multiple deprivation we have information about um, whether they're resident in a, in a coastal community so information that can inform for example the government's leveling up agenda and um, there's a lot of appetite to do further further work with this um, with this information. We also have lots of information on well-being impacts as well, and it would be really good to understand more about how people's uh, recreational activities, their engagement, and their emotional experience to marine environment um, impacts on their well-being. There is the ambition to run the survey itself again at regular intervals um, across the. Uh, the UN decade to look at um, whether indeed that that transformation in ocean literacy um, take does take place and is enabled at least in the in the UK context. Um, the uh, we do hope to work with perhaps some of the other devolved administrations to to with Scotland and Northern Ireland to sort of expand the, the the nations that take part in this survey. There are obviously already existing monitoring activities um, there, so the discussions to be had over the coming months. Uh, we'd like to make the data set available to the academic community for secondary data analysis uh, and to be used in, in um, pieces of research that, that could draw on this data set. Uh, and I hope to have that, that published with the re relevant documentation over, over the coming months. And finally, we hope to commission further analysis of this baseline data to, to model not just um, the, the kind of outcomes and the and proportions of the sample who are answering each question, but also the relationships between the answers to questions. So for example, how do differences in knowledge and awareness impact on, um, on the behaviors and on attitudes? as well as on uh, the tendency to engage with and, and, and visit the marine environment and hopefully that that modeling can be done um, in a way that allows us to hold many of the of our contextual socio-demographic variables uh, the same so we can really kind of um, drill down to one of the key factors there and kind of changing attitudes and change behaviors um, that's all I would like to say about our headline findings and about the development of this uh, project and um, Thank you very much again for, for listening to me over the last half an hour. Um, I know it's very, very hot summer, for summer morning today, so uh, really appreciate that. I'm just going to move us over to introduce our Q&A panel now. Now, I am not actually sure if Emma has been able to join us yet, but hopefully she will be joining us. Um, Dr. Emma McKinley is a research fellow at the University of Cardiff. She's also founder and chair of the Marine Social Sciences Network and she's published research on, on a range of topics relating to societal relationships with the ocean, uh, including ocean literacy, uh, marine citizenship and behaviour change. We also have uh, Dr. Dal Burden. Uh, Dal is an independent consultant and has over 20 years experience in marine research, teaching and consultancy. Uh, he's worked uh, in a range of interdisciplinary projects ranging from economic, uh, uh, ecological economics ocean literacy and uh, various aspects of marine conservation and management. And I'll also be very pleased to take questions about the survey. Um, as I said, I currently sit in DEFRA's Marine and Fisheries Social Science team. Um, I've been working on a number of large public household and online surveys over the last 10 years of my career, including things like the British Birth Cohort Studies. Uh, and I've recently managed um, survey work, both for DEFRA and, and the Forestry Commission. So very, very happy to take questions on, on the survey as well. Um, I'm gonna, gonna just stop sharing my slides now and hopefully between the three of us, we can uh, begin to answer some of your questions about this work. So I unfortunately missed the very beginning of this because my computer just went blue screen of death, but some questions have been emailed in. So I, uh, hello everybody, by the way, I'm Nicola from the Ocean Conservation Trust. Um, so 
uh, yeah, we've had a few emails in and the first question is, which I really like, was there anything in the results that you found surprising? And that's the all. I'm going to pass that out to everyone. <laughs> I'll kick that off if you want. And I, I think Mark knows the data set um, a lot better um, than, than myself anyway. Um, but I think on the whole, I wasn't overly surprised by a lot of the results. Um, a, lot, a lot of the results were what I think I would have expected, which is really good, um, that, we, that our opinion as researchers or, 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 or scientists um, have some connection with what the public are thinking. Um, but I, Obviously, the, the more analysis we start to do, I think we start to, we'll start to find some more interesting uh, patterns in the data, I think, moving forwards. Um, but I think, yeah, initial response for me is not, nothing, nothing too, too out of the ordinary. Um, and again, I think COVID may have a particular inf influence on that, which Mark's already said. Um, so hopefully, if we can get the, get the funding to, to run the same analysis next year and, and subsequent years, then um, I think I think it'd be a very valuable data set, both for, for the science community, but also for policy and, and managers uh, throughout the UK. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Apologies, everybody. There's a, like some crazy drilling going on in the house behind me, so I some apologise for that noise. Um, yeah, I would agree, Daryl. There wasn't anything I was overly surprised about. I think it'll be so so interesting to do that in-depth analysis and look. Like one of the things I remember picking up on when I first um, read through the results was that um, respondents rated the health and well-being benefits of the ocean as being kind of one of the more kind of lower rated things that didn't come up as frequently but then when asked what they got from visiting the coast they said it was really good for their physical and mental health and their well-being so there's a bit of a disconnect between those different questions and i think some of that will be really interesting to unpick and see whether it was particular types of people who said that and really understand the the groups that responded and and, and how they relate to the you know, different areas around England and Wales, um, different social demographic characteristics. So I think, as Daryl said, pulling out some of that in-depth analysis will be really fascinating over the next couple of months. Um, and as Daryl said, you know, I think COVID will have impacted perhaps positively as well how um, people are engaging with the host. It might be that people were going out more when they could and were thinking about going out more. So I think it'll just be fascinating to try and do that again at a later date. Yeah, I would I would just add add to that and pick up on I mean Dal said about some of the engagement data. I think um, although my head isn't surprised by it in a way, my heart is sometimes always surprised to see that nearly a tenth claim to have never visited the marine environment. And we know that there are particular kind of deprived areas where the even very, very close to, to marine environments where there are many who have never visited. And I think it would be interesting to try to use the data a little bit more to understand some of the drivers of that and, and the impacts of some of the socioeconomic factors um, to, to see, um, you know, if, if there's any pot potential inf interventions um, that, that, can, that can help that. Thanks. I think that, that actually uh, links quite nicely to another question. Um, on well the quite the basic what can we do to get more people to visit the coast if this you know if this this research is is kind of showing that perhaps that's one of the the factors um how how can we do that and that's a big question <laughs> maybe uh, i'll go sorry mark i'll go i'll go policy first yeah it's a, it's a really interesting question i'm probably not really going to give a very satisfactory answer. Um, I've been I've been part of a lot of conversations recently that have discussed this, which even which even talk about things like infrastructure and roads and you know whether it, it's a matter, you know, even if it's a matter of that, that some key areas of the, the marine environment are inaccessible. Uh, other other people view accessibility as a, as an issue of um, you know, if a bathing water quality, for example, and you know, that to actually really kind of engage people with marine environment, they need to be able to get in the water, they need to feel safe and confident to do that. So I think there's a, a huge amount of aspects to that issue, um, not just of access, but also kind of engagement and connection. Um, I'm afraid I don't have 
great solutions um, to it, but I can definitely say that there's a huge, I think there, there's just so many aspects of that issue that we are discussing within DEFRA at the moment across a range of programmes. And I think, um, you know, as ocean literacy becomes a concept, which, which I think is growing policy, um, and well, I think we'll, we'll see more work to kind of address that. I'm happy to come in on that really quickly. It was just to think about, I think as Mark said, as, as we think about how ocean literacy and related concepts start to develop and grow um, over the next few years and within the ocean decade and, and those sorts of things, thinking about how we can bring ocean into cross-sector, cross-policy conversations. So it, rather than it just being the remit of one department, it being something that we take into consideration on a broader scale. So when we're thinking about sustainable coastal communities, we're thinking about blue growth, when we're thinking about health and well-being and social care and infrastructure, Mark. I mean, I think it's not surprising that that's come up. We ran a project through the Seven Estuary Partnership a couple of years ago called Discover the Seven, and it was all about creating opportunities to get people to engage with the estuary and thinking about what the benefits were from a well-being perspective. And the two things that came up more often than not were the access to car parks, toilets and the road and in kind of the uh the, the buses road road networks to get there they were the things that came up more often as barriers to people engaging with the estuary so people not knowing where they can park and um, how much it's going to cost them if they're a lose all that sort of thing does create a barrier and so i think taking this much more cross-sector cross-policy whole system approach is something that we're really going to need to do to um create those connection and and connection points and opportunities and part of that is going to be working with government but also working with some of the coastal partnerships working with organizations like ocean conservation trust and with some of the public engagement campaigns that are being run by groups like um somerset wildlife trust and all of the other wildlife trusts as well there's lots of things that we can tap into i guess it's just knowing what's going to work on a on a national scale but also what's going to work on a more locally specific scale as well so there are things being done, but I think we perhaps need to think about it in a more holistic way a little bit. Yeah, I'll just quickly add to that. I think I think one thing that this survey does do is those people that aren't engaging with the coast at the minute, we ask them why are they not engaging? And I think that's the important aspect to find out why people aren't engaging with the coast. Because if before we know that, we can't we can't do anything about it really. We we can advertise it all all, all we like. And I think you're right that a lot of the work I've been doing over the years has, has shown that infrastructure is a huge thing. Um, and it's amazing that access to toilets and free car parks is something which drives people's behavior. Um, so it's kind of, it's, it's things like that you need to be careful of. Um, and I guess, the, I guess things like the, the, the coastal path in England now um, is, is, is sort of doing part way to address part of that. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity there and hopefully the sort of data that we've been collecting Will steer us in the right direction of where we need to invest some some effort. In. Brilliant, thanks, guys. Um, I'm struggling because I'm not supposed to be on the panel, and I want to make comments on everything, but I won't because we've got more questions. Uh, and Hannah, uh, thanks, Hannah, one of our participants, has asked: Are there plans to potentially do this kind of work with a younger audience to see what their understanding is? I think that's a really good question. Um, I guess again, Mark, you're you're the first victim. <laughs> yeah, thanks, um, Hannah. Yeah, we've had um, a number of um, people have sort of made that response to the survey, but obviously this initial pilot was um, was done with adults. Um, uh, uh, the answer is absolutely. I think funding permitted, we would like to expand this um, this work to other demographics, to to younger to audiences. It does certainly. You know there are data collection challenges and you know just for it gets to a point that the surveys have to be changed the questions have to be changed um you know quite considerably to be suitable for different audiences but you want them to be the, the kind of high level um the, the the aims the research aims the questions addressing you want them to meet the same thing so there'd be quite a lot of further development work but yeah it's definitely something that we're interested in doing um, it might be something working with younger audiences that need that would require different methods. So we might be more interested in doing more qualitative work with with younger audiences as well. Um, but we are, yeah, we are hoping to have 
um, it is unfortunately subject to funding and that, that's unfortunately the policy does change year on year but we hope that with our research and development budgets we can kind of alongside this main kind of monitoring survey of adults have a, a package of, of additional work to go alongside it and certainly I think something that's done um, with under 18s is something we would really like to do yeah. Go for it. I was going to die, I'll go for it. <laughs> I was trying to unmute myself again. Um, I was also going to say that I think the fact that the questions and the data is being made available means that perhaps it's, it, you know, there are options for academics, for other groups to take some of this for themselves and start building that, that evidence base. I think we do need to think about how we collate all that information and we create some sort of repository so that we don't lose that data and we make sure we do all have access to it but perhaps that's an opportunity that maybe if there's not funding available for DEFRA to do that work for example maybe that can be delivered through another program of work and um, so that's one option there is a global and um, international ocean literacy survey um which from memory they, they do target under 18 year olds for that work so there is data it's not necessarily obviously focused geographically for England and Wales or the wider UK and um, but there, there have been a number of studies that have looked at, at younger people because ocean literacy was historically linked to formal education and so I think that's probably one of the nice things at, and benefits of this particular piece of work is that we have looked at a different demographic that often gets what well, hasn't been studied and it has often been kind of neglected in terms of the ocean literacy data collection so i think there's definite benefits for us to do that and i think it's something we should we should seek to do um, but there is a real gap in our understanding for the older kind of over 18 um age group so it was a real really important that we, we did that data collection there was nothing really that, um i had the, the most recent study on that scale had been done in like the late noughties like around 2008 so it was quite out of date um so yeah i think there's some some real opportunity for us to think about how we move that forward and whether that might be in collaboration with forthcoming projects and different funding options that might come out through the ocean decade etc so yeah a really important point yeah, i was going to add to that i think that there's a real potential to get ocean literacy type topics within school curriculums um, and i think this this that this could be a very clear way to try and engage and that kind of audience that especially if say a secondary school audience there's no reason why that sort of questionnaire can't be rolled out within schools and get 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 their opinions um throughout the countries whether we randomly select different schools or um i think once you get down to primary level it needs a bit more explanation um, but I think that there's definitely opportunities there that we don't necessarily have to be doing online surveys, that we can be doing surveys that people complete in schools. And I think there's a huge resource there. Um, if everybody involved in the panel and the Ocean Literacy Working Group sent the, sent the questionnaires into their local kids' schools or whatever, then you soon start to get some information for very cheap and very quick um, or no cost at all. I mean, so I think, I think schools is quite something to, to look into. but. I guess OCT might know a bit more about that. There was work done a number of years ago um, by the National Maritime Museum in London um, to deliver a national curriculum programme around marine citizenship, but ocean literacy essentially. Um, but it was really tricky to get it embedded into the national curriculum. And I think that's part of the point I was making around the fact that we need to really integrate this across all policy areas and get the Department of Education involved. If we, if we want to do that, we need to be lobbying that group and lobbying the teachers and having those conversations as early as possible. And um, because it has, we it's been attempted before and we've not been successful. And maybe the decade is an opportunity for it to be a real springboard for that and really launch those conversations and kind of deliver on them and um, a bit more effectively this time around. Yeah, definitely. There is one of the kind of in the ocean literacy strategy framework for the decade, one of the, the, the boxes that they're hoping that would get ticked is that every country has its own uh, ocean or it embeds ocean into the curriculum. Um, but yeah, lots of brilliant research done on the barriers to that. So we, we just need to break down the barriers, which are teachers, um, you know, especially in primary school, often being from a history, geography, arts, English literature background, so they're not scientists, so they just don't have the confidence to teach about the ocean, even though they could, because you know the, the national curriculum exists in England. Um, Scotland, Wales, or, uh, Ireland have their own, um, but in England specifically, teachers really are allowed to teach what they want as long as um, 
you know they're, they're hitting the 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 the, the grade marks for the, the kids um but yeah if they haven't got the confidence but then that's as emma was saying it's that's that complete systems thing um how can we give them the confidence so that they then want to do it cool and actually that probably links to the final question that we're probably going to have time for which is um england and wales why was england and wales chosen and then i'm going to add a sneaky one what other country are there any any other countries that are in mind to kind of um uh, help uh push this survey out globally, perhaps. So, um, sorry, I'm jumping in there, but I probably, <laughs> so it's quite close to this process. Um, yeah, so the, um, we originally had funding to pilot the survey in England, um, just because I think from a sort of policy point of view, the, the teams that commissioned it, that, that was their remit. Um, but we, uh, we obviously kind of work and we're, we speak regularly to researchers from the devolved administrations and it just happened at the time that in that Natural Resources Wales they were looking to develop and commission a survey of, of attitudes to marine environment, which I think is probably clear from the presentation that that was, that was very much encompassed within the ocean literacy dimensions and it just made a lot of sense to work together so we were delighted to have Wales come on board uh, for this pilot as well so we could look at two countries um, I think there was um, if anybody's interested in using the Welsh data it's, it's a pretty good sample size for for making comparisons across the diff different demographics um, as is the English sample so I think um, yeah it was really it it was a sort of it was a bonus really to, to have Wales for the pilot uh, we're very interested in working with the other devolved administrations from this point forward. They do have their own, uh, you know, they do have their own, I know Marine Scotland has established marine monitoring in place, so it might work a little bit differently to how it's done with Wales, but I think that's something that um, I look forward to chatting to the other devolved administrations in the coming months as, as we sort of develop, um, you know, a second iteration of this survey, yeah. And then Nick to respond to the global question. Um, you know, there are other countries doing their own versions. So Canada have done their um, excellent work on the Canadian ocean literacy strategy and, and used a really mixed method approach to understand how different groups in Canada have connected with the ocean. Um, and they have a program of work um, that we could potentially link up with. There's been work done in Portugal. Um, I'm working with some colleagues in the States. Um, Ireland has an ocean literacy network, so there might be an opportunity to link up with them. I think um, the, the, the fact that we are in this first year of the UN Ocean Decade and we're starting to feed into de development of an ocean literacy research program that Nick and I have both been involved in over the last few months, that there's scope for anything. I think we can think, you know, as big as we possibly want and hopefully we might be able to roll out the questions and again I think the, the, the fact that DEFRA have made the questions available and that we can use it as a comparable set of questions and, and keep using those those um, question banks to assess um, ocean literacy in different contexts recognizing that some of the questions might not translate to the cultural context of different countries they might have to be tweaked but it's a brilliant starting point for us to be able to, to do that and to collaborate with other other places so I think it's a bit of a watch this space um, Nick, you might be able to comment on what's coming out from the um, the, the ocean literacy, uh, the ocean decades activity um, on that. Yeah, so um, there is um, an ocean literacy with all program that has become an official um, decade program for the next ten years, and um, the sort of the top outcome of that is um, baseline. How can we get a global baseline? So it would be really um, brilliant if, as Emma said, iterations of this this survey could be um, done uh, around the world in different countries, um, and then that can feed in through through the program, um, so that everybody within that program can you know see the same see the results, um, and then and then that can be used for for how we're going to engage with the public with the, the societal outcomes for the decade moving forward. So I think, um, you know, I've been working in this field for a really long time and it just really feels like ocean literacy is finally kind of getting, getting its, its claws in and being seen as just as important, or maybe not just as important, but as, as important as all of the other kind of the natural uh, science behind how we're going to protect and restore the ocean for the future. So um, 
that's really good. So watch this space. I think it's a bit of a um, a giant program to wrangle, but it's it's in there, which is very encouraging. So on that note, I do note that it is twelve o'clock, and we did say that this um, webinar would be for one hour. So um, sorry, I missed the very beginning. Hello to the participants, uh, head of conservation education and communications for the Ocean Conservation Trust. Um, and what I wanted to say really is, I always go a bit cheesy, uh, but it's just been a really nice experience as an NGO who specialise in ocean engagement. You know, we run the National Marine Aquarium, so we actually speak face to face with thousands and thousands of people all the time. But it's just really great to have that academic um, and policy government uh, input, advice, support, help, where we can all talk to each other about this. And, you know, we just want to, that's what we as Emma was saying, the systems thing, how can we get these different moving parts of ocean literacy um, to work together as, as we do? So it's been, been, been really good. And um, I want to finish just with a little bit of a promotion of something that we've done as the Ocean Conservation Trust on the back of the DEFRA uh, survey. Um, yesterday we launched our Think Ocean Challenge. Um, so, you know, how do we bring ocean literacy to life a bit when you talk about ocean literacy? In the survey, we saw that that it was quite low down the um, list of terms that people actually understood. So Think Ocean is our kind of way of saying ocean literacy without saying ocean literacy. Um, so it's a quiz, it's a personality quiz. Um, you can find it if you go to thinkocean.oceanconservationtrust.org. Um, and it's just a bit of fun, you know, it's not Nobel Peace Prize winning uh, science. <laughs> but the seven questions within the survey are linked to the, some of the questions from the DEFRA survey. And we've added an eighth question this year, which just asks people about their feelings about the fact that it's the start of the UN decade. So if people answer those questions, they get um, an immediate response, which tells them whether they're head, heart, hands or a new thinker in terms of how they think ocean. And then if they put their email address in, they get a lovely email with a PDF that shows them their, the rest of their show um, and, and a, a list of really simple um, habits that they could maybe adopt um, and go with the flow with their show to, to move towards sort of this kind of collective movement of people um, thinking ocean in their day to day lives and, and wanting to look after it. Um, so that really we could not have done that without this kickoff survey. Really looking forward to the demographic. Um, uh, uh, data analysis um, because that will help us even further and I think that that's the really important thing you know as the OCT we want every <laughs> I always go big every conservation organization but as many ocean conservation organizations as possible to pick up on this so that they can really look at their messaging how they engage with people um, and start to build those those connections so think ocean challenge bit of fun uh, find out what shoal you are, join it, share it on Facebook, and um, it's a nice sort of simple way for people to get involved and to collect a bit of data as well. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks to all my lovely colleagues. Thanks to Claire, who's uh, behind the scenes there setting all of this up. And on that note, I will say cheerio and goodbye. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>